How do we know when a creative idea is worth developing and implementing in the process of innovation? In this lecture, I will highlight three limitations of common evaluation strategies and tools that we use, and I advocate a systems thinking approach to evaluation to ensure that they are more ethical and sustainable. When I did a Google search for images associated with innovation, on the first few pages I got several hundreds, thousands of pictures of light bulbs. Now, a light bulb may seem to be, it may be something that we take for granted these days, but like anything that is man-made, at some point in history it was a new idea. It was a novel idea which added value and these two concepts, novelty and value, they're usually used to define creativity. Creativity needs to entail value and also it needs to be um, a new, a novel um, concept. And there are numerous definitions of, academic definitions of innovation and innovation usually encompasses in addition to novelty there needs to be some impact and there needs to be some sort of transformation in culture, tra transformation in the way we do things and this transformation might be direct or it might be indirect. For example Facebook is an excellent example of innovation in communication. Now we might not use Facebook ourselves but we might be at a party and people take photographs of us and those party photographs may be posted on Facebook without our knowledge. So our personal life can become public without, um, without our consent. So this is, Facebook has created an innovative means of communication which has transformed the way we communicate and there is no going back. You know, the, the, um, it leaves an indelible mark on, on our evolution, I suppose. There are two kinds of innovation commonly spoken about, and these are radical and incremental innovations. Radical innovation can be very dramatic, and incremental is gradual um, process. Uh, it's a gradual improvement in product services or systems to make them cheaper or faster or more convenient. Now very often we think about innovation only in industry or as scientific inventions but I believe that on a daily basis we, um, maybe not on a daily basis, but we practice innovation in our personal lives. This can be as simple as going for a radical hairstyle or changing our jobs or moving from one country to another, selling our house, buying a house in a totally different place. Now, you know, it can be a radical innovation when it's a dramatic change in our lives. And as in industry, when we make these dramatic changes, there are risks involved because the outcomes are not guaranteed that it's not guaranteed that the outcomes will be beneficial. Sometimes we might make a dramatic change and find that it was we preferred uh, things the way they were in the past. So there are risks involved and it does require, innovation always requires a process of adaptation. There needs to be courage and resilience when we're walking the untrodden path. And like as in industry, in our personal lives, we can experience both incremental and radical innovation. The process of innovation usually begins with generation of ideas and this generation of ideas might be in response to a problem or an identified gap or it can be uh, ideas to meet either seen or unforeseen needs. And the next stage is evaluation of ideas evaluation of ideas to choose those ideas that we want to invest in, that we want to develop and then we need to do some marketing to see which ideas are the most feasible 
um, before we go on to the stage of implementation. And what I find is that there's a lot of academic literature on the generation of ideas stage and relatively um, little, or hardly any literature on evaluation of ideas. So in this lecture, I am focusing on the, the second stage of um, innovation, the front end of innovation, where we are selecting and evaluating ideas. So how is it that we evaluate ideas? How do we know when a creative idea is worth developing and implementing in the process of innovation? Modern innovative companies such as Google and Apple, they often talk about work environments that they've created where there's a lot of trust between team members, there's freedom to take risks, there's time and space to play and have fun, to reflect on random ideas, and there's usually flexible working hours. They don't expect people to be creative between nine and five. You know, creativity doesn't necessarily work like that. And they create low levels of stress in the work environment. But these factors, this kind of creative environment, is usually associated with the first stage of innovation, which is the generation of ideas. Now, I believe that we think in a very different way in these two stages. At the idea generation stage, thinking it tends to be more divergent, you know, which is sometimes called out of the box thinking. And here there is um, risk taking is encouraged and we discourage criticism. For example, in brainstorming activities, uh, we're expected to accept, be open to ideas without, um, you know, without judging, without criticising ideas because everything is, is, is accepted and um, ideas are not expected to be perfect or relevant or useful. We, we just want to generate lots and lots of ideas. Now, in the idea evaluation stage, we can't afford to be so unselective. We need to be selective. And this requires convergent thinking. Convergent thinking, we need to think about our organisational goals, our, the outcomes that we desire. And the thinking needs to be, well, what, what is it that is relevant? What, what is useful? And in this stage, in the idea evaluation, we don't want to be taking risks because it's high stakes. We don't want to be wasting money. So we are not uh, taking as many risks. We want to be critical. We want to be selective. We don't want to waste our money. So the two ways of thinking in idea generation, ideas uh, evaluation, these are very different styles of thinking. And although I say that there's not a lot of academic literature available at the moment on how we actually evaluate ideas, there are a lot of tools that have been developed and Braddock 2018 reviews 29 of these tools. So this is the list of 29 tools reviewed by, by Braddock and um, the article is available online. And what I find uh, particularly interesting in Braddock's um, review is that she identifies the process from identification and organization of ideas to their implementation. She analyzes this into seven clear phases. The first phase begins with our identification, the organization of ideas. Then we make a list of available methods and techniques we build up a set of criteria to select a particular method or tool. Then we select the tool or method, we implement the method, select the idea, and then we implement the idea. This analysis shows that before we actually select the idea, we've already made a judgment previously at stage four um, in selecting which is the most appropriate tool or method for selecting the idea. And how do we do that? How do we know which is the best tool or method for selecting the idea?
there are various considerations. Maybe we want to think about um, where, do we want to evaluate it as an individual or as a group? Do we want to be objective or subjective? What type of criteria do we want to use? Are we going to cluster ideas through categorization, prioritization, weighting? And what's the level of complexity of the idea? You know, which might have an impact on the level of complexity of how we're going to evaluate it. So first of all, do we want to evaluate as an individual or as a group? Very often, we might like to use a combination of both strategies. For example, an individual might vote anonymously for a preferred idea, and then there may be a group discussion to reach a consensus about which ideas to put forward and which ideas to reject. When we are making our preferences as an individual, they might be very different to the group preferences and you know we all have assumptions and biases and we may be um, not open to unfamiliar ideas. So the group consensus may be a way of overcoming you know these individual assumptions, these individual biases and it might allow us to include multiple perspectives and diversity in judgments although not always because sometimes if there are dominant people in the group they there might be a case of following the um, the majority or the most vocal people in the group so just because we have we're trying to reach a consensus in a group it's not always the case that all you know that there is an increased level of inclusivity the second consideration is do we want to be objective or subjective in making this evaluation? Um, if we want to take an objective approach, we might be looking at quantitative data related to the idea and we might be looking for factual information. Whereas if we're taking a subjective approach, we might be looking at qualitative opinions and interpretations around the idea. If we take the views of credible experts who are highly confident. They might make intuitive evaluations which we accept readily because they are experts and we, um, we value their, their authority. On the other hand, if it's um, novices making an evaluation, they might be more confident in using tried and tested factual information rather than interpretations because they might not have the prior experience to make intuitive evaluations. And even when we are making informal evaluations, we tend to use criteria. This criteria might be conscious or unconscious. For example, if we're deciding on which restaurant to eat at, we think about whether it's affordable, accessible or pleasant. We might not be consciously thinking about that. But at the gut level, you might feel, I really don't feel like going to that restaurant. And you might not be able to articulate why. Uh, or on the other hand, you might feel particularly drawn to a place. And again, you don't really know why you feel drawn to that place. But it's, you know, maybe a set of unconscious criteria that you're using at the intuitive level. In the business context, again, the criteria will depend on the level of complexity of the idea and also the stage in evaluation. At the initial stage, we might be more interested in the novelty of the idea. And at a later stage, we might be more concerned with the feasibility. And later on, you know, the potential return on investment. And at some point we have to take into consideration to make sure that the idea is legal, it's ethical, and it's a strategic fit and it's a timely. Um, we would be implementing the idea um, at the most convenient time. And 
if we have a very large number of ideas, in order to make these ideas manageable, we may need to cluster these ideas either through categorization or prioritization or weighting. And this categorization at first may be very rustic. We might put ideas that are a strategic fit into one category, ideas that are ethical, legal in another category, ideas that make the product or service faster, cheaper, more beautiful in different categories. And we, might, we may put radical ideas that involve a great deal of risk in a different category. The level of complexity of the idea is going to be very important in terms of deciding on the level of complexity of the tool that we're going to use to evaluate the idea. If it's a very simple idea with a low level of investment, we might use a very simple evaluation tool, for example, a SWOT analysis to identify the strengths, the weaknesses and the opportunities and the threats associated with the idea. But if the idea involves a high level of investment and it entails a high level of complexity, then we may need a very complex tool which requires training. And with all these, bring in mind all these different issues that we need to take into consideration and the 29 evaluation tools highlighted by Braddock, they seem to have at least three limitations that I have um, identified. And one of these limitations is that there's a tendency to isolate ideas within a narrow range of focus. Secondly, there's a lack of feedback loops. So, you know, we, we can't really answer the question, what happens to the rejected ideas? And we don't really know how influential the unconscious drivers are when we're using these evaluation tools. So first of all, the first limitation that ideas tend to be evaluated in isolation or a narrow range of focus rather than within a complex context which is more inclusive. Isolating ideas overlooks emergence of new ideas and we don't recognise the patterns of complexity and there isn't an opportunity for synthesis of ideas. And when we're looking at the second limitation, what happens to rejected ideas? Well, ideas may be rejected for a variety of reasons. For example, they don't fit the selected criteria, they're low on the level of priority scale, or they've been tried and tested with unsuccessful results previously. Now, the feedback that we usually receive when ideas are rejected is cursory and it's not usually effective in stimulating any kind of growth in the idea and it tends to be compliant rather than creative. For example, if the idea doesn't fit the criteria, well which criteria could it fulfil? And if the idea has been tried previously, why did it fail? And how could the challenges be overcome? The third limitation is about the role of the unconscious. Hardly ever is the role of the unconscious in, um, acknowledged when we're evaluating ideas. Now the unconscious is often associated with the idea generation stage. Very often people will say that they received or they generated their creative ideas while they were sleeping or taking a shower or walking in the countryside or on a bus for example. So we know, um, it's no surprise that um, ideas may be generated at an unconscious level. However, when we are evaluating ideas, sometimes people say that they have a gut instinct about which is the best idea, or they might say, I need to mull over an idea, I need to sleep on it, I need to contemplate the idea for a while. However, we don't really know what is the period of incubation that is required for sleeping on it, for example, or for reflecting on it. The period of incubation is associated with creativity, 
um, the creative process incorporates that stage of incubation but at the evaluation stage we don't really know what is required how long do we need to incubate how long do we need to mull over an idea or to sleep on it and so I'm advocating a systems thinking approach to overcoming some of these limitations the systems thinking approach can enable us to be more inclusive ethical and sustainable systems thinking enables us to contextualize ideas to identify relationships and patterns between ideas so that we can synthesize different ideas and it creates space for emergence of new ideas and there are feedback loops for ideas that may be rejected. Contextualization of, of ideas is very important. Systems thinking sees life as complex and interwoven relationships which can be physical, emotional, social or ecological. The saying the ancient Greeks used to say the whole is greater than the sum of its parts and that really encompasses the essence of systems thinking that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Peter Senge, the um, management consultant, he uses a metaphor to describe what is meant by the whole is greater than the sum of the parts because he says that dividing an elephant in half doesn't produce two small elephants and similarly Midgley says a random heap of organs is not a human being. So these metaphors enable us to um, have a sense of that you know the, that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. We can't just analyse and evaluate ideas in isolation, as it were. In systems thinking, cause and effect are not linear relationships, especially when we're talking about conceptual knowledge, for example, creative ideas. We have to look at creative ideas in a circular rather than a linear form because ideas are complex and they are they entail interconnected variables and it's very often difficult to identify the linear causal relationships between ideas. Ideas are constantly cha changing and uh, one idea may be perfect in one context and totally inappropriate in a different context. So we need to take the context into account. In the process of innovation, stakeholders are usually taken into consideration. However, there tends to be a very narrow, relatively small number of stakeholders that are taken into consideration. For example, we may be thinking about the customers, the investors, the employees, but systems thinking enables us to broaden the scope so that we're thinking about a much more diverse range of stakeholders who might be either directly or indirectly influenced by the creative idea. This leads to more accountability and more sustainability so that we can mitigate the adverse effects of the innovation. Because not all innovation is ethical, not all innovation is sustainable. For example, when we look at um, Ritchie's argument about the high price of cheap food, he talks about innovation in agriculture, which has led to very fast production and distribution of food, but at the same time, it poisons land and water, it damages people's health, and it might ruin you know, the well-being experienced by farmers and food workers. So when we're only looking at a small range of stakeholders, we might be ignoring costs such as air and water pollution and disease from toxic exposure and the social dislocation which is pushed on to future generations. Very rarely do we focus on future generations as an essential stakeholder that we take into consideration in the process of innovation. When we're thinking about the context being important we can look at the organisational structures within which these creative ideas are being generated. For example, is the organisational structure a network or is it a hierarchy? 
highly innovative companies, for example, Apple and Google, tend to favor very flat hierarchies or network structures which imitate ecology, the natural dynamics of plants, and ideas arising in explicit collaboration where there's joint ownership, there tends to be greater commitment in achieving the desired attention. On the other hand, in hierarchies, there may be a tendency to favour ideas from higher up in the hierarchy because those ideas are associated with power. And if we're at the lower rungs of the hierarchy, we will need to persuade our direct manager of the value of the idea before the idea is pushed up to senior managers. And if we're not able to uh, convince our line manager, our immediate manager, about the value of the idea, the idea is unlikely to see the light of day. And also, when we're looking at hierarchies, the ideas that are offered by marginalised people who are on the fringes of society may be ignored. There is research to suggest that slum dwellers in, in India, for example, contribute to development of many small enterprises, for example, enterprises related to recycling. A lot of those ideas came from those who had to recycle as a matter of, you know, it, it was essential for them to recycle. It wasn't a luxury to recycle. And so those ideas were, were generated by slum dwellers. However, in a hierarchical structure, there may be lack of space at the board table and the voices may not be included. Language is very important in evaluations because the language used influences our perception and therefore the quality of the evaluation. Senge talks about the Western languages, but how they shape perception, because in Western languages we have a subject-verb-object structure which may encourage a linear view. When a person presents a creative idea using their second or third language, there may be distortions in communication. With systems thinking, we're able to overcome this through feedback loops so that there's a variety of languages, including the first languages of the evaluators and also the first languages of the idea generators. And these languages may be very different. In systems thinking, we're looking at relationships and patterns because the Assumption is that creativity occurs in dynamic relationships rather than inanimate objects and we aim to map these relationships to look at the patterns and the configurations rather than measuring and weighing the ideas. When we look at ideas in isolation we're ignoring the value generated in patterns. Patterns might be, for example, if it's a radical idea the pattern may be totally disrupted and it might look like chaos. Whereas if it's an incremental idea, the patterns may enhance previous patterns. The essence of systems thinking lies in these void spaces where patterns reveal themselves. And sometimes we need to shift our perspective in order to connect the dots. For example, if we're looking on the reverse side of an embroidered picture, we might just see a very messy, uh, random kind of connections and long threads and, and it might not look very aesthetic. In order to see the beauty of the picture, the aesthetic beauty, we need to turn it the right way round. Likewise, ideas may be presented the wrong way round or we may need to shift our perspective to see previously imperceptible patterns. System thinking also incorporates and uses complexity theory. This complexity theory is small changes can lead to a huge impact. A seemingly insignificant idea can lead to dramatic impact and transformation. Again, Facebook is an excellent example of this because it began with a very insignificant idea. Like um, the the aim was to 
measure the popularity of students at a university campus in the States. And this idea of measuring people's popularity by clicking on their photos has transformed the way we, we communicate with each other across the world. There are lots of parallels between system thinking and the process of innovation. Innovation is seen to be complex, it's non-linear, it's a collective process which can take place across decades and multiple sectors. And if we look at this definition of innovation, it can also describe systems thinking just as easily. Systems thinking focuses on synthesis rather than analysis. Analysis entails breaking things apart into individual pieces, whereas synthesis is looking at the interactions between these individual pieces. It's bringing those individual pieces together to look at a much broader context. And this allows for emergence of ideas in the spaces between the ideas. On the other hand, with analysis, we tend to ignore the spaces between the ideas and those spaces remain void and unexplored. Emergence is another feature of systems thinking. Now Capra and Luisi, they define emergence as the novel properties that arise when a higher level of complexity is reached, putting together components of a lower complexity. And the new properties that are present in the higher complexity thing are not present in the parts. They emerge as relationships and interactions between the parts. A good example of to demonstrate emergence is animated films. Now, animated films are usually made up of thousands of static pictures, which are shown at very fast speed in sequentially and that creates apparent motion. And popular methods of uh, evaluating ideas, when they adopt a linear approach, they ignore the nonlinear process of emergence that can, that can uh, arise. And rejected, very often, ideas are rejected merely because they are beyond the scope of the evaluation. So what happens to these rejected ideas? I like to use the metaphor of a job interview. Say a potential employee is being selected or they can be rejected. They may be rejected because they're not a strategic fit or they fall short in comparison to other candidates in meeting the criteria. Now, if this happens to you, you've been rejected and you believe that you were the best candidate in your view, you might want to challenge that rejection by asking questions. For example, who made the decision? Was it an individual or a group? What tools and techniques did they use to make the decision? And why did they choose those tools and techniques? Were the criteria used to evaluate your performance fair and balanced and accurate? However, the feedback that you usually receive if you've been rejected from um, a job interview or, or a course that you might want to do, the feedback is usually cursory and lacking in substance. It doesn't really respond to these questions unless, of course, you make a formal complaint, in which case your feedback may be taken more seriously. But on the whole, feedback loops are not in, in they're not present. And so the feedback that is given is unidirectional. The person who evaluated you gives you the feedback, but you don't have the space or the opportunity to give the feedback to the evaluators. So feedback loops are very important in systems thinking. And one way to describe feedback loops is through the thermostats that control the temperature when we have our central heating on, or the way weather um, is formed, you know, the way rain or the storms are formed, you know, this is usually, this is always a result of very highly complex inter interconnected variables and feedback that we receive may be both positive and negative. It may be visible or invisible. It may be conscious or unconscious, verbal or nonverbal. And you know that when you 
have a very cold reception to your ideas, that might inhibit the flow of creative energy. On the other hand, when there's a warm reception to your ideas, that might create a fertile environment for a creative idea to be shared, nurtured and developed. Temporality is a very important feature of systems thinking because we need to bear in mind that nothing is permanent and temporality is exists in all living systems and there's constant circular processes where things are shaping, reshaping in response to new situations. Likewise, creative ideas are constantly changing, decomposing, reshaping. And so one of the limitations of systems thinking is that it tends to focus on external facts and conscious choices and it ignores the unconscious influences. We need to do more research on the impact of the unconscious, for example, on intuition. How important is sleep and dreams in intuition? We know more about the association of incubation with emergence of ideas, but we don't know as much about incubation and the role of incubation in evaluation of ideas. We, t we know a lot more about the association of relaxation, confidence and autonomy in generating ideas, but we know less about these variables in creating environments that are conducive to evaluations. I believe that systems thinking can raise the quality of our evaluations by contextualizing rather than isolating the creative idea and this would lead to more inclusion, more, more space for emergence and synthesis of ideas and establishing useful feedback loops that nurture and sustain the creative idea until the time, place and organisational vision are appropriate for it to germinate. This nurturing and sustaining creative ideas would avoid loss of ideas, you know, it would avoid wastage of ideas that are not selected. We may need to shift our perspective to see the inherent quality and value of ideas and gatekeepers in particular need to be very reflective and contemplate on how they're evaluating. For example, are they taking socio-cultural diversity into account? You know, what about the linguistic variables? You know, how can they be more ethical and sustainable in the evaluations that they make? I believe that exploring the impact of unconscious influences through self-reflection, contemplation and mindfulness in a low stress and high trust environment, we need to uh, explore further on that. Now, evaluations tend to be very linear, unilateral relationships between subject and object. The English language, for example, we have a subject, verb, object, linear relationship where a judge judges the judged, the evaluator evaluates the evaluated and very rarely do we have that feedback loop where instead of merely using an evaluation strategy to evaluate a creative idea, we do the reverse. We use a creative idea to evaluate the evaluation strategy and using this circular relationship between the subject and the object I believe would lead to more continuous improvement in the way that we evaluate. So how do we evaluate creative ideas? What strategies do you use? How important are each of the following when you make evaluations? How important is the context? How important is feedback loops and the role of the unconscious mind?